Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Emanway. Say hello, Scott. How about I say hello to everybody else? Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> it's lovely to to speak to you. Yeah, Scott's tired because he worked today. He has a job. Back at work in the office, and so I had to get... Been waking up at two on average most days. In the, in the afternoon. Last, in, this is yeah, not two in the morning. In the last couple of weeks, and all, all of a sudden it's 7 a.m. for me. Uh-oh. Yeah, I'm having a nice little nappy new before I come over. There you go. Yeah. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chomp, chomp, chomp. Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or the UK, text HOME to 741741. You'll be matched with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free, 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, please go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. Let's get on with the show. Let's do that. Early one morning in 1906, the bodies of two men were found on the trail on opposite sides of the small saloon and brothel called the Two Mile House, north of Hazleton, British Columbia. Two Mile House was on the way to the indigenous village of Kispiox. The men had been gunned down in separate incidents. Both had been shot in the back and police believed the similar locations of their wounds and short time frame between the slayings indicated a single killer. Well, damn. Suspicion for the murders fell on local indigenous businessman who was called Simon Peter Gunanute. As he and one of the men had a physical altercation only the day before, he was the number one suspect. Fearing that he would not get a fair trial, Simon Gunanute and his brother-in-law, Peter High Madam, also implicated in the murders, absconded into the wilderness. So because they were implicated in this, let's head for the wilderness. Let's, let's head for the hills. Let's, yeah. Their escape triggered the largest and most expensive manhunt in British Columbia's history. Holy Christ, really? Years later, after the tally was in, the search for the two men had cost the British Columbia government $50,000, which equals almost $2 million today. This is episode 126, The Legend of Simon Gunanute. Gunanute. Yes. So after feedback regarding a previous episode, we've replaced any racist language in the quotes that we use in this episode with more current terms. There we go. From an archived page on BritishColumbia.com, quote, Situated amidst the majestic landscape dominated by the 3,000-foot walls of the rugged Rocher de Buell mountain range, Hazleton is a wonderful stop 
off the Yellowhead Highway for visitors traveling between Prince George and Prince Rupert. Ah, so it's northerly. Very much so. Yeah, it's actually okay. the northernmost tip of Highway 16, which is also the Highway, highway of Tears. Tears. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I haven't, uh, I don't know anything of Hazelton. Yeah. Well, we're going to learn a little yeah. bit. Named after the hazel bushes which paint the river-carved terraces, the towns of Hazelton, New Hazelton, and South Hazelton are collectively known as the Hazeltons. Well, there's a trio of Hazeltons. And they are the totem pole capital of the world. Whoa. Uh, Emily Carr, the artist, yeah, went yeah. and painted the totem poles in the area. Hot damn. Yeah, that sounds so great. You can see some of her paintings in the Vancouver Museum and yeah, those yeah. kind of things. The Hazelton area has nurtured Northwest Coast native cultures for over 7,000 years with the Gitsan Wet'suwet'en peoples always living there, where the Skeena River meets the Bulkley River. The Skeena River served as an ancient trade route navigated by 60-foot cedar canoes traveling from the coast upriver to totem-filled villages with magical names like Temlaham, Gitanmax, and Kispiox. Sweet monkey balls, that's a huge... Boat. A huge canoe. Yeah, 60-foot canoes, yeah. A canoe at 60 feet. Wow. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Insane. We also mentioned Hazelton in another episode of Dark Poutine. It was episode 75, as it was here that the U.S. Air Force Nuke Laden B-36 crashed on ah. Valentine's Day in 1950. Ah, okay, the broken arrow. That's right. The man we know as Simon Peter Gunanut was born in 1874 to the Gitsan First Nation and was a member of the Kispiox Band. He was the son of two hereditary chiefs. His mother was a chief of the Fireweed Clan and his father was of the Frog Clan. According to Pierre Burton's story about him in his book My Country, quote, his name originally Zump Min Hoot, heavily anglicized to make it pronounceable, meant the little bear that climbs trees. Well, Yeah, okay. that's a kind of a cool name. It's pretty adorable. Right? <laughs> According to the KispioxBand.com website, the community of Kispiox is one of six ancient Gixan communities which exist today in the area. Kispiox is estimated to be about 3,000 years old having existed like several other villages since the time the population was dispersed from the ancient city of Texemilaxamid by a disaster. Hmm. Archaeological and oral history evidence indicate that the Gitsan occupied the valley of the Kassan or Skeena River following the last ice age about 10,000 years ago. Wow, I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but disasters are not good. Villages have been found and abandoned throughout Gitsan history. Texemilaximid was actually a utopian city, like a Garden of Eden, yeah. where people of the area once lived in peace, but legend has it that the disaster we talked about was caused by children tormenting a baby goat. Uh, what? They incurred the wrath of the mountain goat spirit who summoned a great landslide that killed many people. So what did you get for messing with a goat? Yeah, don't mess with baby don't, goats. No, you don't, don't want to... You don't want to upset this mountain goat spirit. You really don't, because landslides. But it's a good way to explain a landslide, uh, I guess, in, <laughs> sure. in your lore. Sure, yeah. I, I don't know, maybe like, I'm, I'm thinking like a more more fierce, and the, the, the wolf spirit. The wolf spirit? Yeah, no. you've angered the wolf spirit. But they and... angered the baby goat spirit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very adorable landslide must have happened. <laughs> Very, yeah. <laughs> Killed a whole bunch of people. It wasn't uh, adorable at all. Adorably. Prior to contact with Europeans, the Gitsan peoples were an organized nation with a strong economy. Per the website Gitsan.com, quote, The Gitsan pre-contact economy was based on the trading of salmon, other natural resources, and products slash goods derived from these resources. Lots of trading occurred along Greece trails with neighboring coastal First Nations for the Ulichan, candlefish grease. The Gitsan had a well-organized society pre-contact with political, social, legal, and economic institutions based on the Huilp house groups. Gitsan institutions based on natural law, balanced lifestyle, respect, and obligation to the community, which governed pre-contact Gitsan society, continue to be at work today. So, 
Wow. They still keep up some of their old it practices. Sounds, sounds amazing. Of government. Seriously, yeah. sounds amazing. Since contact, the Gitsan have always asserted ownership, jurisdiction over, and the right to self-government on Gitsan territory. End quote. Before the Europeans came, <laughs> sounds like things were going just honky-dory. Yeah. 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 And then we came along. Yeah, and, and messed everything up pretty good. The Gitsan territory covers an area of about 33,000 square kilometers, Mm. and that's about five times the size of PEI. Holy shit, really? Yep. Wow. Even as the Europeans first bullied their way into the area, greedily in search of gold and furs, the Gitsan people continued to assert their rights to their territories. There was, and still often is, a lot of friction and mistrust between the groups, Mm -hmm. especially around the time that Gunanut was born. In 1872, only two years before his birth, members of the Gitsan nation took action against the Europeans when, quote, the chiefs from the Gitsan community of Gitsegolka blockaded the Skeena River to all trading and supply boats to protest the actions of the miners on their territories. Does that sound familiar? It sounds incredibly familiar. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And this is 1872. Yeah. Various other protests and legal challenges have been mounted in the intervening years. Many of the members of the Kispiaks, Simon Gunanut's family included, were converted to Christianity by Catholic missionaries and encouraged to leave the old ways behind. Many began to adopt the white man's new ways, wearing suits and living in single-family shacks other than their communal homes. Yeah. But they maintained their connection to the land and their ancestors, Simon's father, Nagun, taught him how to trap and all he needed to know to survive in the bush alone. Hmm. According to Pierre Burton's book, My Country, and the chapter on the search for Gunanut, quote, In his childhood, he had hunted and trapped on his family's traditional preserve a hundred miles to the east at Bear Lake. But as he grew older, he ranged further afield, farther afield, until he came to know a vast area. 10,000 square miles in size, as well as most men know their own neighborhoods. It's a lot of square miles. It really is. I personally am more of a round mile kind of guy. Okay, fair enough. At 21, he was a remarkable human specimen. Six feet tall in his moccasins, 200 pounds, light as a cougar on his feet, and just as swift. Wow. With his Winchester 3030, he was a dead shot. It was said that he had once killed a bear with a knife and that he could straighten out a horseshoe with his bare hands. <laughs> now, if there's any ounce of truth to those, holy cow. Yeah. Wow. Gunanute, growing a mustache like a white man, inspired that kind of tale, mm. end quote. Simon's mother disliked the idea of him not being educated as well. Uh, as the world was changing... So she sent him to a religious school where missionaries taught him. Hmm. From the Williams Lake Tribune, at some point in his childhood, Simon was sent away to school at Port Simpson, a coastal settlement about 20 miles north of Prince Rupert. Missionaries from the Methodist Church operated a residential school there, and Simon received what was considered at the time a fairly good education. So residential school. Yeah, yeah. Simon Peter Gunanut was a hard-working hunter and trapper, and thanks to his schooling, he had a mind for business. If he didn't like the price being offered for his furs, he would tell the potential buyer to go shit in their hat (laughs) and travel as far as necessary to earn whatever he felt his wares were worth. So he'd even gone so far afield as to go to Seattle to sell things. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a man who's got confidence in his product. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And his worth. Yep. Again from Pierre Burton's My Country, quote, He saved his money. In 1901, when he had enough to marry, he took his bride Sarah and their first baby to Vancouver to buy supplies. Gunanut had decided to embark on a venture that, for an Indian, for an indigenous man, was unheard of. He planned to open a store in his village. He prospered. In the winter, the family closed the store and went trapping together. Hmm. In the spring, they sold their pelts, bought more stock, increased their cash reserves. Gunanut kept building up his equity. He bought a part part interest in a sawmill, started a ranch on the Skeena, raised horses and cattle, a pillar of the community, 
until the world fell in on him, end quote. Well, until that point, this man mm -hmm. has more ambition <laughs> in, in his toe than I have in my body. Yeah, right? Wow. Yeah. So it sounded like he was a very talented yeah. guy yeah. who could walk both sides of the track, you know? Like he yeah. he was able to operate in our capitalist cash society thanks to his knowledge yeah. of, you know, his own way of life. Culture and yeah, history. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. It's really great. His competence in the way of his ancestors and modern education made Simon Gunanut one of the most successful and respected men in the Gitsan nation. Mm. There are also those, though, who envy the success of others. So Simon had a few people who resented him deeply for having what they couldn't seem to acquire yeah. on their yeah. own. The original and traditional name of the place where Gunanut lived was Anslaw, loosely translated from Gitsan language, this means the hiding place. From his ranch, he also ran a pack train supplying the gold prospectors in the region. Shit. So he was really Jesus, enterprising. Yeah. On June 18th, 1906, Simon and his brother in law, Peter Heimadam, rode 10 kilometers to the nearby community Hagwillet to get fish for their two families. On the way home that evening, they decided to stop in at the notorious tavern called the Two Mile House. Mm. This type of place was not allowed within two miles of the growing God-fearing village of Hazelton, thus its name and location. Okay. According to Pierre Burton's book, the establishment was run by, quote, Jim the Geezer Cameron. He had founded the Two Mile House to cater to the hard-drinking trappers, hunters, guides, and indigenous men. Mm -hmm. It did not matter to Cameron that the law forbade him to serve natives. He had two charges pending against him already for that offense and another for operating an illegal gambling house, but he felt no compunction about serving Simon Gunanut and Peter Heimadam. So shit, back then it was illegal to serve indigenous people? Liquor, yeah. Oh, wow. In a white establishment, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Wow. Okay. The men sat drinking and playing cards late into the night. Gunanut and High Madam were feeling no pain. One man, also drinking in the tavern, was Alex McIntosh, a massively built dock worker and a laborer. He had just been released from jail that morning as was well known as a brawler. Mm. He had been told to leave town the next day and had promised to do so, securing a position as a laborer in a horse pack train headed north. McIntosh, upset that two prosperous, well-dressed indigenous men were mm. drinking in a white man's bar, made comments about Gunanut's wife, Sarah. Oh, you don't do that. Some reports claim that McIntosh told Simon he had, quote, become close to Sarah while Simon was off trapping earlier that summer. Mm. Mm -hmm. Gunanut could not let the comments slide, and a fight broke out between the two men. McIntosh bested Simon thanks to his size, and Gunanut was badly beaten up. Mm. He was said to have carried a long scar on the side of his face for the remainder of his life thanks to a slash from McIntosh's knife. Gunanut got his licks in, though, breaking and bloodying one of McIntosh's fingers. Well, great. Gunanut picked himself up off the floor, and he and High Madam left the tavern. Witnesses said that they heard Gunanut shout on his way out that he was going to come back and, quote, fix Macintosh. A few others claim they heard him mention he was going to get a gun. Okay, so he's not, phew, for a minute I thought he's going to, I'm just going to bring back uh, um, some medical supplies. And fix his yeah, finger. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. No, he's going to fix him. Wah, 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 wah. Macintosh was seen riding off around the same time that Gunanut and Hi Madam had left. McIntosh's foreman took one look at the man's badly damaged finger and told him he needed to get it repaired before the pack train left that morning. Mm. McIntosh rode off toward Hazelton, where the small hospital was, but he never made it there. Okay. Alex McIntosh's body was found on the trail just west of Two Mile House at around 8 a.m. the next morning, near a planing mill. The man had been shot off his horse through the lower back in an ambush. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. From a 1958 McLean's Magazine article, quote, 
John Boyd, a squat, dark, indigenous man, coming into Hazelton for supplies, found the first body, that of Alec McIntosh. It lay face up, arms and legs extended, face swollen, and shirt stained with blood. A bullet had entered McIntosh's back about two inches to the right of the spine and emerged an inch below the collarbone. Oh, shit. So, angled up. Yeah, so it looked like the person was laying prone when they shot him. Mm. McIntosh had been shot through the heart and had died before his body hit the ground. Damn. His horse was grazing lazily near his body when it was found. Another body was found around the same time on the trail on the other side of Two Mile House heading to the east. This man was named Max Leclerc. He had been in camp with two Englishmen at Kispiox Crossing. He had told his campmates he was headed to Hazleton to get a horse but he never made it there. Leclerc's fatal injury almost matched McIntosh's to a T. He too had been shot through the back. Leclerc apparently was unknown to Gunanut, so the motive for his death was not clear. BC Provincial Police were on the scene for both shootings and thought that there was a madman on the loose. After hearing of the fight between Gunanut and McIntosh, he was suspect number one. Yeah, understandably. They did barely any initial investigation and didn't even bother collecting spent cartridges that were seen nearby. Oh, so just going by the word of some people. Yep. That was great detective work. A posse was struck and headed off to Anlaw, Simon's ranch, to arrest him. And we will take a break right here. Posses are always great. Yeah, for you know, sure. Unless you're the one the posse is after. Right. Yeah. We don't have enough posses, although Sir mix used to have a posse on Broadway. He had a posse on Broadway. Yeah. I don't think it's the don't same know. kind of posse. No? No, I it's think a it's a song. very different kind of posse. It's a great song anyways. Posse. I'm just saying. I think this one may include pitchforks and torches. Well, it could be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very, very easily it could yeah. include those things. Yeah. As the posse... On Broadway. As the posse was about to reach Gunanute's place, a group of four men related to McIntosh passed them, headed in the other direction. Mm. The men told police that he wasn't at home, but claimed that the man's rampage had continued on his own ranch. Sure enough, when the posse arrived at Gunanute's, they found four of his horses and two of the man's dogs shot dead. What the hell? And there was no Gunanute. No Gunanute's wife. No Gunanute's children, and his mother was gone, as were High Madam and his family. So I guess maybe you take care of the animals, because if you're fleeing, well, nobody else is getting my horses. Maybe, but why wouldn't you just flee on your horse? This is a great question. Gunanute's aging father was tossed in jail for aiding his son. From McLean's, from a McLean's Magazine 1958 story on Gunanute, Quote, knowing the close bonds between the two, it was thought that this would bring Gunanute in to Mm. face his accusers. A boastful deputy, Windy Johnson, was put in charge of the jail. Wily old Nagun, allowed to exercise in a log stockade adjoining the jail, soon discovered that the outhouse, though entered from the inside, was built outside the walls. He also discovered that two of its wallboards were loose. On the third evening, he escaped into the mountains. His jailer from then on was known as Silent Johnson. (laughs) So Windy became silent. Yeah, well, you know, Windy is a great name for a guy who farts a lot. (laughs) A search party was made up of police and volunteers to go hunt for Gunanut and Peter Highmadam, who were now nowhere to be found. As their families were missing too, nobody had any idea where they had gone. Well, in their mind, if he had just... Uh, you know, if they had just shot and killed some people, who's to say they didn't shoot and kill their family as well? So I'm sure that would have been one of the concerns. Sure. Had. The searchers expected quite a trek as Gunanut was a master woodsman. A story in the July 23rd, 1906 province newspaper. Oh my God. It's been that... around for a long time. My God. It says, organized search. Government agency and party start on long trail at Hazleton. 
Hazleton, July 23rd. I feel like I should be... Do, 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 exactly. Do, do, There's probably... This, yeah. There was probably a telegraph yeah. involved. John Fluin, government agent at Port Simpson, arrived here some days ago, and after completing the organization of a party to hunt down the indigenous murderer Simon Gunnanut and his brother-in-law, Peter Hymedon, Hymedon, who is supposed to be identified with the crime... The party, consisting of five men in the charge of government agent Berryman from Aldermere, Bulkley Valley, took pack horses and provisions sufficient to last them till the fall and started for Kishkigash, the indigenous village about 70 miles northeast of here, on the Bear Lake Trail where the fugitives were last heard of. <laughs> the government raised the rewards for their arrest from $300 to $600. Whoa. Those old newscasters, the people who would read the news like that, it always sounded like they've got somewhere else to be. Yeah, right. I'm in a rush. I've got to read the news to you, and then I've got to go and get my car. I'm on fire. <laughs> if the sighting was factual, the two had covered a lot of ground in just four days, especially with wives and children in tow. Yeah. And they had a massive head start on the searchers. Mm. 70 miles is a long ways away. Yeah. On, in those days. Foot, yeah. And in the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> and wilderness that some white men have never, ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The search would go on longer than they had anticipated. Much longer. The wilderness in the area that Gunanut was familiar with, as yet unseen by European eyes, was so vast that you could hide Nova Scotia, PEI, and the island of Newfoundland there. Shit. The two men and their families might almost be impossible to find. Yeah. I mean, if Bigfoot is there, and we haven't found that. Would it be Bigfoot or the Yeti in that region? Oh, it would be Bigfoot. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. I'm thinking winter, cold. It's not that far north. Oh. It's north, but not that far. Oh, it's not Antarctica? No. Antarctica's south. Oh, they moved it? <laughs> the next report in the province came on September 29th, 1906, a full two months after the double murder. Holy crackers. It would appear that the posse after Gunanut and High Madam thought they were close. Mm -mm. The headline read, May Capture Murderer. <laughs> the fugitives have been seen crossing Bear Lake with 4,000 pounds of provisions. Holy shit. Most likely on the way to Gunanut's family hunting ground near the headwaters of the Peace and Laird Rivers, the searchers were lugging 1,200 pounds of their own supplies and planned to set up headquarters in the area so they could comb it. So they're basically bringing a town with them. Pretty much. Yeah. Oh, well, there's only five searchers, but... 1,200 oh. pounds for five searchers, oh my but God. Gunanut and uh, Peter Hymedham had 4,000 pounds. Two tons worth of stuff. My God. Yep. A report came on November 6th that Gunanut had somehow doubled back over his tracks and was making his way back toward Hazleton. So, you guys go that way, I'm going to go this way. The man who was quickly becoming a living legend had come to the indigenous village of Kitsagas, where he asked for food and medicine, mm. claiming his wife was ill. The people in the village gave him what he asked for, and he disappeared back into the bush. In early 1907, the reward had grown to $500 for each man. Well, So now. people are getting angry. Yeah. Over the next year and a half, there were sightings of Gunanut in various places around northern British Columbia. But by the time BC police constables showed up, he and his crew were long gone, if they had ever been there at all. Mm -hmm. They suspected that many of Gunanut's friends knew exactly where he was, but no one was willing to turn him in. So it's been going on for a year and a half? So far. I mean, at what point do you go, well, we tried. Well, we'll get to that. Wow. <laughs> the search in the remote area was costing the government thousands of dollars. Yeah. The search party was running low on supplies and it was way too expensive to keep resupplying them. Yeah. So in February of 1908... A year and a half after it had all begun, the posse returned south empty-handed. Yeah, I mean... But they weren't done. Oh. As reports of sightings of Gunanut and his band continued to make their way to authorities, another plan was hatched to capture him. Over the years 1909 and 1910, two operatives from the Pinkertons were called in by the BC government to search the north for Gunanut. From the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, 
Pinkerton National Detective Agency was an American independent police force that was founded in 1850 by Alan Pinkerton, 1819-84, former deputy sheriff of Cook County, Illinois. It originally specialized in railway theft cases, protecting trains and apprehending train robbers. It solved the $700,000 Adams Express Company theft in 1866, and in 1861, it thwarted an assassination plot against President-elect Abraham Lincoln, end Uh-oh. quote. So they were super famous. No the Pinkertons kidding. were really, you'll see them in, yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard them referenced and talked about, but I didn't know they were an independent police force. Yeah. Wow. At the time, these guys were the heavy hitters in the mm-hmm. in the world of crime fighting. Yeah, equivalent, I guess, to now calling in the FBI. Something like yeah. that, yeah. From David Ricardo Williams' book, Call In Pinkertons, quote, On arrival in Vancouver, they outfitted themselves, broad-brimmed hats, thick wool shirts, and Mackinac jackets, heavy underwear and trousers, stout high-laced boots, as well as a tent, mosquito netting, picks, shovels, billy cans, and most important, perhaps, guns and ammunition, for they would have to live off the land as they traveled, end quote. Damn. So these guys were prepared. Yeah. I'd be like, ah, you know, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Send, send Peter up. He loves this kind of stuff. So kitted out, the two Pinkertons agents headed north to begin their search. Their efforts, too, were thwarted at every step. Just when they thought they were hot on Gunanoot's trail, he would slip away. They were not getting any help from the indigenous people in the area who resented the two brash Americans even driving their horses away at one point (laughs) and then telling them they had to pay for them to go look for them. (laughs) Sweet. The Pinkertons gave up their search in February 1910, returning to Hazleton in poor weather. Wow. Talk about elusive. The official search ended there. Yeah. For nine more years, sightings continued, but Gunanut remained a free man. The stories about him grew more and more fantastic. From Monty Bassett's essay, Chasing Shadows, quote, There are many stories that Gunanut not only did all that was attributed to him, but that he had supernatural powers. Oh, yeah. For example, he could deflect bullets just with his will, making them curve away from his body. Wow. He could become invisible and pass through his pursuers' camps unseen. Makes sense. His dogs trained to never make a sound or leave a track. Whoa. Can you floating imagine? dogs. Yeah. Clearly. <laughs> wow. Dogs and little hovercrafts. <laughs> Special boots. Special little doggy boots. <laughs> that's just, it's incredible. I think that's all accurate. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 It has to be accurate. Yeah. There's no way that that's... Uh, uh, just a story. No, no. I'm sure it, bullets got me matrix in it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Fact. From the Williams Lake Tribune, quote, the First World War came and went. Automobiles arrived in Hazleton. A railway line was established to Prince Rupert and the population of the area doubled. Mm. Gunanut and his family group not only survived, but they prospered. He continued to trap and trade During his years on the run, he amassed a fortune estimated to be around $75,000. While on the run. While on the run. Wow. However, it was a hard life. By 1919, Simon was 44 years old. Two more children had been born and baptized, and he wanted all his children to be educated. End quote. That's right. Gunanut gave himself up and came in to face the music. Wow. After 13 years. Wow. (laughs) I can imagine that being a very hard life. Right? Isolation. Yeah. And that's, that's the biggest thing is like, I mean, we're, we, we've done isolation for three months and we're just going bonkers. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah. He was alone though when he turned himself in because Peter Hymedum had died in 1910 while on the run. So. Oh, shit. Yeah. Back at Hazleton, Chief Constable Kelly was waiting at his desk for Gunanut's arrival. He had heard he was turning himself in. Mm. Simon walked in, cool as a cucumber, and said, I am Simon Gunanut. I've come to turn myself in. Kelly had never been face to face with the accused murderer before, so he didn't know what to expect. Yep. Kelly's eyes flicked to three rifles in a gun rack on the wall near where Gunanut stood. 
Simon took note of the man's nervousness and said, Don't be afraid of me. You never saw me before, but I know you, and I could have shot you many times out on the trail. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. According to McLean's magazine, Simon Gunnanut was, quote, remanded to a higher court. He was taken south to Vancouver and lodged in Ocala prison mm. until October 7th, 1909, when his trial for the murder of Alex McIntosh was set to begin. Gunnanut pled not guilty to the charges against him. Gunnanut's trial would be for the murder of Alex McIntosh alone, as the evidence linking him to Max Leclerc's murder was much, much weaker. Simon was pre represented at trial by a well-known lawyer, Stuart Henderson, who had helped to broker the surrender. The Crown's case against Gunnanut was circumstantial at best and was delivered in a day and a half. <laughs> Shit. He was described as grim and expressionless as he sat in the prisoner's box to hear the evidence against him. The story of the fight was told and the discovery of the body of McIntosh. The lack of gathered evidence at the crime scene and the fact that they had no witnesses or murder weapon created some major holes in the Crown's case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's literally, um, we heard that you had a fight. Well, they did have a couple of hearsay witnesses who said that Gunnanut had, quote, admitted to the mm -hmm. killing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, his lawyer picked that apart. Yeah. A witness for the defense was a young boy who at the time of the shooting had seen both Gunnanut and McIntosh as they left the two-mile house early that morning, both riding in different directions. So Gunnanut did mm -hmm. not follow him. Mm -hmm. Also, Simon's lawyer pointed out Alex McIntosh was not well liked. There were a number of folks around Hazleton who would have rather seen him dead than alive. He didn't seem like a decent fella. No. The fight that he and Gunnanut had that night gave someone the perfect cover to commit a murder, knowing it would be pinned on an mm -hmm. indigenous man. There had been no physical evidence tying Gunnanut to the crime at all. Yeah. Henderson called the policemen involved stupid. I mean... Yeah. He said that they had their sights set on Simon right from the beginning with no other leads pursued. It does seem like that. And that's the way it was. Yeah. Henderson also brought up the question, why would Simon shoot his own dogs and horses? Yeah. Perhaps it was the Macintosh boys who had just been to Simon's ranch on a vigilante mission. Oh, okay. And they were the catalyst that had scared him into fleeing. That it would do it. Somebody comes onto your property and starts shooting up your animals. You're going to beat it. You're going to say, well, this isn't going to uh, bode well. Yeah. The jury left the courtroom for 15 minutes. Oh, my God. <laughs> At 4.30 in the afternoon on October 9th, 1919, they returned with a verdict. Guess what the verdict was, Scott? Oh, uh, guilty. It was not guilty. Wow. Yeah. I thought for sure indigenous individual. Yeah. You know, this is just That's like, what I thought formality. I was <laughs> wow. Yeah. Good. There was more good news the next day from an article in the province on October 10th, 1919. Quote, when court opened the next day, Mr. Justice Gregory said the charge against Gunnanut was not going to be proceeded with in the case of Max Leclerc. Yeah, you said they have less evidence and exactly. everything, so yeah. The judge said the evidence is not as strong as in the other case, and I am instructed by the Attorney General to enter a stay of proceedings. I am not surprised and view the other case, it would seem hopeless to proceed. Hmm. And then he said, prisoner... Stand up. You will be under a certain amount of suspicion, but so far as the court is concerned, you are a free man. Now go away and be a good man. Hmm. End quote. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Good interesting. Old yeah. It's kind of a nice ending to this story well, for him to go free because. I mean, there was never anybody else charged. Yeah. But. A, a potential murderer was set free. But he, he wasn't convicted. He was found not guilty. Mm -hmm. And plausibly, somebody else did it. Yeah. And I kind of like this guy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there are differing opinions on who done it. For sure. Some say he did. Yeah. Uh, others say, no way. And then there are, are other things that rumor that Peter Hymadam's wife actually admitted on her deathbed it was her. Hmm. who had killed them for some reason because they had been interfering with her. Hmm. So maybe there was some actual truth to what was going on. Interesting. Okay. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Huh. Who knows? 
that could all be just rumor and speculation yeah. as well. I mean, the case is over a hundred years old, so like the truth does tend to become obfuscated uh, over the uh, years, you, you, you days. Yeah, right. <laughs> days. Oh, right now. Yeah. Right now, if you if one side says something and then the other side says something, you're never sure what the truth no, is. No, no. Yeah. You can't throw a hundred years what? into Guess Everybody's the mix. lying. Yeah. <laughs> At least now you can kind of go and do a bit of your own digging and there's probably going to be video footage and you can something. make the, Back then though, it's like, no, it's just what people said. Yeah. And so, like, Yeah, well, somebody said that he said it, yeah. that he did it. Yeah. Well, okay. Then there you go. Let's yeah. hang him. Yeah. Crazy. Whew. Reporters asked Simon to explain why he ran away. Gunnanut told them that after the fight at the roadhouse the night before, his face was swollen and he was embarrassed. He didn't want anybody to see him until he healed up. He was near his house when he heard the Macintosh boys come into the yard and shoot the dogs and horses. So, to be safe, he took off. Mm -hmm. He was on the trail away from the house when he found a pair of woman's moccasins in the mud. He caught up to his wife and mother who had run away before in fear of their own lives because they were right there at the at the ranch when these kids came in to yeah. shoot the place up. Gunnanut told reporters he was never actually very far from Hazleton most of the time. <laughs> People had known where he was and warned him when the police were in the area. <laughs> and when he saw searchers himself, he would, as he put it, skidoo. <laughs> Wow. He made it seem like it was easy to stay hidden with his entire family for 13 years. Maybe it was for him. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Holy shit. So he returned home to his land. Wow. On Monday, January 22nd, 1934, the province newspaper reported that Simon Gunnanut had died of influenza while trapping north of Bowser Lake. Mm. The historicplaces.ca website says... Upon his death in 1933, Simon Gunnanut was buried on a height of land overlooking Bowser Lake, a place known as Graveyard Point. Yeesh. The site is valued for its historical and cultural significance as a reminder of the struggles of First Nations on their own lands in their relationship with non-Aboriginals and non-Aboriginal laws. It represents the collision of old and new cultures mm -hmm. and the attempt of First Nations to live in both worlds at a time when a First Nations person accused of a crime was almost guaranteed to be presumed guilty. Well, yeah, exactly. Like I was saying, that's exactly what I thought was going to happen. The site was deliberately chosen to be south-facing and protected, yet difficult to access. It is a reminder of the dichotomy between the vastness and harsh nature of the country into which Gunnanut disappeared with his family and the familiarity Gunnanut had with the area as he followed a traditional way of life. The location is significant for its aesthetic setting and as a place where Simon spent much of his time, hmm. end quote. And his father is buried there too. Hmm. I'd kind of like to visit that area someday. It sounds uh, magical. Uh, Mystical. It, yeah. Sounds mystical. Yeah. 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 It does sound kind of mystical. Yeah. But it's also 14 hours away <laughs> by car. <laughs> oh, shit. You could fly to Prince George maybe yeah. and then drive another four hours. Ah, if you're going to drive, just drive. Yeah. Just drive it. Fair enough. And that's it for this week's case, The Legend of uh, Simon Gunnanute. Well, I quite enjoyed that one. Yeah, it was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. There's murder, there's mayhem, there's there's weirdness and it do bullet dodging and the and the right guy gets away yeah 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 i mean it you know he was a he was like a god-fearing christian man he was not a violent person ever anybody who knew him said this was not something that he would have ever done yeah although to insult somebody's wife in that way in that culture it was a very very offensive thing and then to get into a fight with said person and lose to said person, mm -hmm. you know, and especially if some wobbly pops were involved. Exactly. And you were a bit sauced. I mean. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's lost to history now and, uh, I, nobody else was ever charged, like I say, with the crime. So. Yeah. It's interest. It's an interesting story. It is. It is. I mean, yeah, I, I can't say, I don't want to say that. Yeah, no, he was com obviously innocent. Eh, who knows? But uh, a, a fascinating and really interesting tale. And I really, you know, aside from the murder, 
I really liked the cut of that guy's jib. Yeah. Well, like I said, we don't know if he did it. Well, no, I'm <laughs> saying whether it, I'm just saying like murder aside, if that wasn't involved, yeah. I, I really liked this guy. Like he was really, um. He was an interesting cat. Yeah. Like, the whole idea that he was, he was, uh, a, a respected businessman in, in European culture yes. as well as. In the 1800s And he was, a, he would be a hereditary chief himself because yeah. his parents both were. So. Yeah. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Huh, says Scott. Huh. Well. <laughs> well, how about them apples? Huh. Yeah, that's a gooder. Well, I guess it's time for voicemails. Oh, I, for, I gotta, uh, it's impossible to not bring up like a guy uh, accused of shooting somebody whose name has gun in it. Right. That's just. It also had, had newt in yeah, it. Yeah, gun and newt. But, uh, yeah. just that's, I just think that's great. Yeah. They probably were like, who did it? And they're like, I, who, somebody, does anybody have gun in their name? That <laughs> could have been it. That's how, that's who, definitely if gun is in their name, they did it. Yeah. But that gun and it was the anglicized version of his name. So. So, oh, so it was the setup. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. By the Europeans. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Let's do the voicemail yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you want to leave us a voicemail, you can at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. That's one eight seven seven Dark Putin. Yeah, that's right. And if your voicemail stands out, you might hear it on the show. Or if it's the only one that we got this week, <laughs> it might also make it on the show. <laughs> it also make it on the show. So for some reason, people don't like to call a toll free line. And leave a message because uh, not this week they don't. Not this week. We only got a message, yeah. a single one. Uh huh. So we're gonna play it. Oh, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers you guys crossed. suck. Fingers, fingers crossed. The... <laughs> you guys are terrible. Well, thanks for taking the time though. To... <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> don't do it ever again. Oh, it's only twenty three seconds long. Wow. <laughs> oh well, let's hear it. Hey, Mike and Scott. My name is Beck. Uh, your show is pretty interesting. I was just curious if maybe you could do an episode on some Canadian military uh, crime or something. That 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 would really pique my interest. So, yeah, you guys have a good one. Hey. <laughs> well, thanks, Beck. Yeah. I think that is actually a really good idea. Yeah. I have been kind of looking at the... Uh, Russell Williams case again. It's one of the ones that I am so fascinated with, mm -hmm. always have been, just because of his stature. You know Alan Warren talked to that guy. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What did he have to say about crazy. that? Crazy. Yeah? <laughs> He's really crazy. <laughs> but I mean, like, the guy met the queen. Uh, his stat, like, his, his position mm -hmm. was a very, very yeah. lofty yep. uh position and so they like, talk about double life like it doesn't get much more double than that and no. so i've always been fascinated by and huh. then like his um confession yeah well that might be coming back so hang yeah. on who knows yeah i have a feeling it will be this summer at some point yeah good yeah well you know you got to do it sometime yeah yeah uh, well we... and it's not like it's one that's very well known in canada but... which is why we haven't done it we we sort of try to stay off the beaten path and yeah. do things a little, little left of center yeah. or right of center, yeah. or whatever off center. But, uh, but yeah, every once in a while we do have to cover those ones that have been covered to death. Yeah. Well, but in Canada, I don't think it's been covered to death in the States. I know a lot. Oh, like, it has, in, yeah. you know, has it? Yeah, like, I don't, I don't think people in Europe and whatnot are going to be very familiar. But you know who hasn't covered it? Dark that's, Poutine. That's yeah. Right. So if Dark Poutine does it, it's going to be a little different. Damn Skippy. It always is. All right, thanks, voicemail. Yeah, thanks for uh, the single voicemail yeah. this week. Watch next week; we'll get ten yeah. because people. Yeah, but guaranteed, we'll 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 play the interesting ones. Yeah, like really make them interesting. Yeah, if you do a fake voice or something, or make up a little story, yeah. whatever. We'd love to hear it. Yeah. So this is your challenge. We are challenging you to do something. <laughs> it's a, hello. This is Werner Herzog. I'm calling to say. I really love Dark Poutine. Oh my God. It is a wonderful show and uh, it makes me wonder as I stare into the abyss, <laughs> why, why on earth you boys 
don't have more money <laughs> and your own television show. This is Werner number two, I agree. <laughs> so it's Werner's clone over there. Anyway. Could you imagine? Okay, if you're like a celebrity and you're listening, please call and leave us a voicemail. Oh, us my God. Voicemail. <laughs> we would just do cartwheels around this. If you're floor. not a celebrity and you're listening. Please call us. Oh, absolutely. Could you just imagine, though, like you, you, yeah. we listen one time. Or pretend like, you're a celebrity. It's like, hey, this is Brad Pitt or something. You're like, wait a minute, what? Yep. It's toll free. I mean. Well, who knows? Ryan Reynolds might listen because he's very oh, Canadian. Right, or Ryan. Or Ryan Deadpool. Or Ryan Gosling. Scott's oh, in love with Ryan he's Gosling. dreamy. Ryan Gosling. Leave me. Hey, people, Twitter storm Ryan Gosling. Get him to send me a voice. Is back. Ryan Gosling like your, uh, if- if you did it once, you're a guy? Oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, twice Look. even. Oh. If I did it twice, yeah. Oh, Ryan Gosling, dreamy as hell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. Yeah. So, yeah, people. Yeah, he's a good looking man. Blow up uh, Gosling's uh, Twitter and get him to leave us a voicemail. Cause, there you go. Because uh, I'd get all the... Scott would be all a Twitter himself. Uh, yeah, yeah. He'd be a little Twitter probably, pated. Probably get the vapors. Oh, isn't that gas? I don't know. Well, I always have that then. <laughs> you always have gas? Yeah, well, I guess I've always got, the vapors are constant in my life then. Well, they are. I've I've been at your house where the vapors quite uh, extensively yeah. are uh, vaporizing bashed the room. about. Yeah. yeah, it's really terrible. Yeah. It smells like, uh, what was it that we saw, Carol and I saw in a movie and she can't stop saying it now? Says your farts smell like a some uh, like a, a dumpster behind a Hungarian restaurant. <laughs> yeah, I take pride in my. <laughs> this is gonna gross out most of the people listening. Oh. It, sh- it should gross you all out, but probably most. Uh, I did one time. I I woke up. Uh, my wife. Oh no! She was in a deep sleep, this out one. cold. She is very hard done. By I me. woke her up. Like, it, like, like, I didn't, like, jostle her. She woke up just by the smell of a heart alone. Well, that happened at our house uh, when we used to have a dog. Our dog woke us up with oh, a fart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> with a fart. Yeah. I, I took a lot of pride in that. Like, it wasn't, it was silent. Like, there was no sound. It was the, just the smell was so bad. Oof. She woke up. That's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anybody who maybe thought uh, kind, loving thoughts of me. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's kind of gone now. Well, look at that. It's time for some Patreon shout outs. What, what? People are still Patreoning us. Well, that's good. They are becoming patrons. Patronizing us. They are patronizing us. Amanda Myers from Springfield, Missouri. How about that? Thank you, Springfield. Amanda. Springfield. Yeah. What yeah. does Amanda do there? Does she work at the nuclear plant in Springfield? No, no, no. Mm-hmm. She She works at the water refinery. Oh, she refines water. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. She, you know, she gives it a good education. Yeah, there you go. Teaches it good manners. Here's here's how you set up uh, forks properly on a table. Wow. S- don't arc your back while sitting. Elbows off the table. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Next we have Erin Buck, and she is from Seattle, Washington. Oh. What does she do in Seattle? Does she work at Pike's Place, Pike's Market, and throw fish? No, she has the less glamorous job there. Oh. Yeah, she catches the fish. Well, that looks pretty glamorous too. Have you seen it done? No. They throw like a giant fish and then the guy who catches it wraps it up and gives it to the person. No, I don't know, Mike. What? Like fishing rod catches the fish. Ugh. No, no. That's what she does. Oh, she catches fish she with catches, a fish. Oh. Yeah, no, not the Pike Place ca- fish catcher. Oh. Yeah, no, that would that'd be pretty... I don't know if that would be a good gig or not. It could be. They're good at it. It's fun to go and watch them toss the fish about. But no, no, she just, she heads out in a rowboat. There you go. And uh, casts a reel and Hmm. hopes she catches a big old salmon. Okay. Does her job. There you go. Yeah. People, People do it for free sometimes. She gets paid. So we had somebody upgrade their patronage. Oh, Laura Jane Hoshino from Wait a Tokyo, Japan. Wait a minute. Arigato. Laura. Arigato. I know Laura. We we both do. Yeah, she's super nice. What does she do for work? Uh, she is an English teacher. Well, she, she was. I think now she's teaching um, 
Oh God! Oh, you're giving her the real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think she she she's was supposed to start, but then the um, you know pandemic the, the kicked COVID in. COVID kicked um, in. Was like singing, teaching singing. Oh really? Yeah. Oh cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next we have France, uh, France or France Andre Lefebvre, mm-hmm. and she she is from Laval, Quebec. Oh well, that sounds right. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sorry if I butchered your name. I really apologize. It happens, though. What does she do in Laval? Oh, well, unlike last week when we had the um, uh, the syrup in the snow, yep. and somebody did tell me what that actually is called. What is it well, called? I, I couldn't pronounce you it. Can't, okay. yeah, I couldn't pronounce Fair it. Fair enough. It's not, she does not do that. That is not her job. What in, does she do? In Quebec. Uh, she, get ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. It's going to be very topical. I'm I'm so ready. She makes poutine. Wow. Yep. She has a poutinery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she has a poutinery. Very authentic uh, French-Canadian. Well, she is French-Canadian. Yeah, that's so. what I'm saying. So it's very authentic. Um, I've had some. Oh. Yeah, she says she'll, she'll ship it over. Oh, it won't taste very good when it gets No, there. she has a special poutine in, preservative in, encapsulator. Oh, okay. To keep it fresh. That's a lot. Of yeah, and stuff. and sends it over and uh, I thought she would have sent you some. But I guess no, she didn't know. offer me Weird. any. Weird. She I probably guess, uh, she probably thought I was Ryan Gosling. Uh, yeah, something tells me that she did not. <sighs> yeah, so I mean, how topical? How topical that is a, that? A poutine Creator supports dark poutine. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's at least one. There better be, God damn it. <laughs> Everything we've done is, is in vain. There has to be. There has to be. Yeah. Like even if you work at uh, Burger King and you make the poutine there. Oh boy. It counts. Yeah, it does. Uh, next we have Cecilia Fraser. Oh. And I don't know where she's from. Oh, Bangkok. Oh, she's from Bangkok. Yeah, you, if you couldn't tell by the name. Cecilia Fraser is yeah. from Bangkok. Yeah. yeah. And, and what does it's she do? a very do, common name in Bangkok. What does she do in Thailand? Oh, um, she, okay, she doesn't do Muay Thai. Oh. She doesn't do Muay Thai. She is Muay Thai. <laughs> she is. No, you, have you seen, you know, when they have to kick the trees? Oh, gosh. To, to, to toughen up their shins? Yeah, that looks brutal. Yeah, she's the tree shaper. To make it more well shaped for kicking, they pretty much kick any old tree. No, I know, but not like the actual. But they have like you know wooden, like you you carve it oh, down. Oh, like a fake and, tree. Yeah. It, well, no, it's like they take it. It's real wood, Mike. It's, it's a from tree, a real it's, tree. It was previously it a was tree. Previously a tree, <laughs> and then they 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 you know cut it and and uh, shape it, and you can so when you're training, you can enjoy some good old uh, tree kicking. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, not if you're the tree, but. Enjoy your tree kicking there in Bangkok, yeah. Cecilia Fraser. Yeah. If you've, if you've kicked any of her trees, let us know. Drop us a line. <laughs> tell us. Tell uh, us, tell yeah, us in tell, a voicemail yeah, about l- kicking, l- kicking let us, Cecilia's trees. Let's, let's give her work some praise. You, you tell us, give us a live review of, of her work. Okay. <laughs> Next we have Brooke Tang and she is from Lavon, Texas. Oh. Yeah. And what does Brooke Tang do in Levon, Texas? Oh, yeah. is she one of the Tang family? No. No? What? Unless you mean like the actual drink Tang. Yeah, that's what Oh, I mean. okay. I thought maybe there was some Tang family I'm unaware of, like some famous- No, I mean- Oh, the, the Tangs, the Texas Tangs. Yeah, the Texas drink Tang. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what she does. You know astronauts drink Tang. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. So she she they, is I, I, she is like the heiress to the Tang yeah, fortune. Yeah. She's just she doesn't actually have to work because the Tang mm-hmm. she got the Tang money. Well, but, that's uh, probably why Brooke's helping us out because she's got yeah, that Tang money. Throwing, throwing around some of that around. Tang money. Yeah. And uh, you know, so she's just living a good life. A lot of charitable work. Good. Like supporting dark routine. <laughs> that's very charitable. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So she's uh living in Texas on Texas Lake. Hmm. Yeah. There you go. Texas yeah. Lake. Texas Lake and you Texas. Just, yeah, boy, you're pulling these ones out. Oh, no, no. Facts. Next we have Andrea Gawweiler, and she is from Kitchener, Ontario. Oh. And what does she do in Kitchener? What do you think is going on there? Oh, she uh, makes linoleum flooring. Hmm. Yeah. 
Is it specific colors or is it just all straight up? It is specific colors. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it, she makes rainbow linoleum. Oh floor. boy. I know. It's, I it's know. like pride lin- linoleum. It really is. That, wow. It really is. It's, 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 you know, somebody had to break that, break into the market with that particular product. Yeah. So. yeah. I mean. Good for sh- you, Andrea. Should you drop some food? Good luck. Uh, finding it because it's just going to blend in. And very... don't ever do LSD in your oh, house. Oh, no, do do it. Do do it <laughs> on that floor. your floor yeah. would look yeah. like it's like moving all over oh, the place. You, you would think you're, you're, you're floating on a rainbow. Oh, no, it would be terrible. No, it'd be great. And so, uh-huh. yeah, uh, she's pioneered that um, uh, manner of linoleum. I mean, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, Cheryl Lyon has upped her pledge. Oh. I don't know where she's from, though. You don't know where Cheryl no. Lyon is from? Nope. Anchorage. Alaska? Anchorage, Alaska. Oh. That's the one. You know it. I've heard of it. Oh, good, good. Yeah, right? she's from Anchorage, Alaska. And what does she do in Anchorage? Does she build anchors or- Ha uh... <laughs> ha, you got it. <laughs> nailed it, Mike. <laughs> wow, for, for the first time you ever on the show. nailed it. Home I run. nailed it. Home run, so out she, of the park. So she creates anchors in Anchorage. Yeah, yeah. You would think that they're like iron forged or- more, more like uh, a is gigantic. It, is it like in a weird epoxy resin? No, no, oh, no. See, no, I didn't get that. No, right. she whittles. She whittles the metal. It. Yeah, you don't. You don't think people whittle metal? They don't. No, but she hand. <laughs> she hand. She hand carves. Oh, yeah. These. Uh, she started with the reason why she hand carves metal was well, she started with wood. Yeah, she thought she'd make she'd break into the wood. Uh, uh, Carving. Car- wood anchor- anchors. Yeah, but they tend they, to float. Yeah, they, would, they yeah, just they, float They're not very useful. And so she took that skill of whittling and translated it to metal. She must have very strong arms. Oh my God, you have no idea. She got some guns. Yeah, if, she, if she hits you, oh man, you're out. Well, thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, thank you. Next we have B, as in B-E-E. Oh. Reed. B. Reed. B. Reed. If you insist, I will. <laughs> and uh, I don't know where B is from. The B. hive of some some sort of hive. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And and let me guess. She is a, uh, a honeybee. She's not a honeybee. No? Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> no. Uh, she's actually from Esquimalt. Oh. Yeah, in BC. Oh, okay. It's on the island. Oh, by Tofino. But what does she do? Uh, she is a weather, um. Vane, a an, human weather vein. <laughs> Well, no, a weather, I don't know how they, an announcer, like, so if, like, if it's they raining. To, they used to call them a weather girl or a weather Well, no, weather no, because it's, it's like, she's like, she. But that's antiquated language, yeah, so. Yeah, she, she would like. She would be a meteorologist. She would go, no, no, she goes outside. Oh. If it's raining. She just says. She has, it's raining! <laughs> Oh. Yeah. And you know, it's, a, it's sunny. Oh, wow. So she yells it to, to the community. Like people really can't figure that out for themselves. Well, I mean, you're just, your curtains are closed. You're chilling at home. You're thinking, I wonder what it's, I wonder what the weather's you like. You don't want to go out in case yeah. you catch the COVID. It's a bit chilly today. No, well, maybe. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Well, thanks, B. Uh, thank you, B. Thank for, you. For yelling about the weather. Yeah. There in a squimal. Yeah. Kind of like that guy in the, who's uh, in the the East Coast there, who's got the. It's going to rain. Oh, it's Frankie McDonald. It kind of like it's kind of like that. I love but Frankie, not, McDonald. but without the YouTube. Yeah, just yelling it. I think he's fantastic. Oh, well, yeah. that's pretty much what he does. He yells. Yeah, he's great though. Oh, he's incredible. Uh, and lastly, f- as far as Patreon mm-hmm. goes, we have Priya Ramnath oh. from Dublin, Ireland. Yeah. Wow. I would, I would love to go to Dublin. So what does Priya do in Dublin? Priya? I think I, I need to have a little poo. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. You've seen That's... the IT crowd, right? Oh. Yeah, not all of it. Oh. Uh, but Priya, get this. Go ahead. She makes Priuses. So uh, Priuses are made in Ireland? They are. Yeah. I thought they were Japanese. Well, it's a fine line. Japanese, Irish, it's same thing. Potato, potato. <laughs> I get it because potatoes and Irish. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. No, it was hilarious. No, uh, that's, that's about the troubles. No, no, that's hilarious. The potato famine is funny? Yeah. Well, no, not really. Potatoes. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so so I hear. Uh, yeah, so she makes Priuses there. Oh, yeah, Priya makes Priuses. Well, thank- it just seemed like it was kismet, you know. Thank you for making Priuses and then sharing some of your money with us. Yeah, we appreciate. It. We got some of that Prius money. <laughs> we got that Prius money. Oh boy. Um. Yeah. So we did get some donut money. Oh, did we now? And it was from Jennifer Gidry. Okay. She's been a, around uh, for quite some time as far as uh, supporting our show. Has she? She definitely has. We see Perfect. her in the Umber Yard and oh. all that kind of stuff. And the message from Jennifer is, hello, gents. Here's some donut money. Sorry to, sorry it has been so long. Oh, no. I'm, I'm on furlough and have really enjoyed listening while I piddle around the house. Whoa. Shut up. She's peeing around the house? I, I th- don't think that's what she means. I don't think so either. But that, my dad used to call having a pee, having a piddle. Yeah. So it would be make like, sure you piddle before like, you get in, get in the car. I would say like and my dog piddled in the house, left a little, you know, some. So while Jennifer, where is this house that Jennifer piddles around in? Bratsik. Bratsik? Bratsik? Where Bratsik, is that? It's in Russia. Oh, it's in Russia. Of course. And what does she do whilst piddling? Oh, in Ru- <laughs> it, she makes, um, uh, oh, it's Russia, you know, so. Nesting dolls? No, they have her, uh, she she works in a mine. Oh, no. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's well-paying job. Poor Jennifer. But it's not, it's really hard labor. It is hard labor. It's really hard labor and dirty. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah. Your hands get really sore from, yeah. the, from pickaxing all day. I can see it. I think that's what they do in mines. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. Thank and you. And thank you so much, Donut Money donators. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine or for one-time support, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Now, we did have somebody Uh-oh. send us a a little bit of an interact transfer. We did. Legsy Charlton. Oh! Yeah. So, where does Legsy live again? Well, uh, Legsy yep. lives in... Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember. I'm not pulling up my phone. No, I'm trying to no, remember. That would be cheating if you do. I, and that's that. not. That's not. She, oh yeah, yeah. She's from Pyongyang. Oh, Pyongyang. Yeah, North Korea. Oh, she, oh really? Yeah. Is she? Uh, does she work for Kim Jong Un in some way? Well, or um, is she the one who tells she, him she, that he's actually a pretty good guy? She and, can't really talk about what she does because oh. it's North Korea. She, her and her family will probably be killed. But I, I'll tell you. Okay, what? Uh, she, um, she's a train, she's a subway train operator. Well, that's not very exciting. They actually, well, <laughs> it's one of the only modes of transportation for most people there, Mike. Mm, so yeah, I mean, still. And, and they oddly put a lot of money into their subway system. And so, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. So she's a subway train operator. Well, good for you, Lexi. Yeah. I hope I didn't just get her killed. Well. By talking about Yeah, it, it could be terrible. Yeah. But thank you again. Yeah, uh, thank you. yeah thank it you, means a you. lot that you want to support the show, and she's always been big, big supporter of ours. So. A gooder egg, a gooder she, of the gooder. She is one of the goodest eggs. Yep. If you don't already, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show. You can easily find us on iTunes, Podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, where we don't have a hundred million dollars. Well, I was just gonna say, maybe they'll uh, give us a hundred million. <laughs> you never know. Huh. Uh, you you can find us wherever you get any kind of podcast. So. Um, check out our website, darkpoutine.com for show notes and other stuff. Give us a like or follow on Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Guten Tag. Guten Tag.